But if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to start in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read to you a couple of verses, verses 8 and 9. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. If you find it, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word just briefly as we look at these two verses of Scripture. Peter's writing to believers, and he says, starting in verse 8, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. I want to focus in on the last portion of, of these verses. It says, rather than returning evil for evil, rather than being snippy, <laughs> rather than being rude or insulting, it says instead, give a blessing. It says, give a blessing because you yourselves were called to inherit a blessing. Amen. We are called as the children of God to receive the blessing of salvation, to receive the blessing of eternal life, to receive the blessing of eternity with Christ in glory. And if we are recipients of the blessing then that should be a motivator for us to be givers of blessings rather than of curses. In today's message, we're going to read about blessings and talk about blessings. Father God, as we open your word this morning to begin to try to proclaim your truths from it. Lord, I pray that you would guide us in the proclamation of your word, guide us in the understanding of your word. Lord, help us to hear and understand your voice clearly and correctly. Lord, that we might be transformed by the power of your words. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can turn back now to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48. As we continue our series through the age of the patriarchs. Genesis chapter 48 is very near the end of the book. Beloved, we're getting close. In fact, next week we will finish this series. Next, next week, we will finish our series on the chosen church, and we will wrap things up, and that will free us to have a, a service on the following week, two weeks to, from today, uh, for, for Christmas. But today, we're in the second to last of these messages, and we're going to be talking about blessings. The sermon is called Jacob's Final Blessings. Both chapter 48 and 49 deal with Jacob blessing various members of his family. But what exactly is a blessing? You know, we talk about blessings all the time, but what is the definition of a blessing? Well, if you look it up, at least in the dictionary that I used, the definition is very simple. It says, God's favor and protection. God's favor and protection. So, when we receive a blessing from the Lord, we're receiving an expression of God's favor towards us, or His protection from us, or of us. When we pray and speak blessings upon others, we are asking God, in essence, to pour out His grace and His kindness 
upon that person. We are invoking the loving care of God for whoever it is that we are praying for. Whoever it is that we are blessing. Now this is a very common practice within the church. You see priests, you see pastors, you see various religious leaders throughout various denominations and even some non-Christian denominations who pray for blessings. Now obviously as Christians, we pray to the one true God who is the source of all good gifts and the source of all blessings. But the act of blessing is, is common. Not only is it common in the church, we see it in, in families. Fathers pray, mothers pray for their for blessings for their children, for their for their grandchildren, whoever it might be. We pray for one another. We we see the act of blessing one another throughout uh, various various settings. It's very common. We as Christians are called to bless one another. Just as Israel, by the way, was chosen to be a blessing for all the world. You know that the Abrahamic covenant, which encapsulates God's purposes for Israel, had three parts. Has three parts. The first part was, Abraham, of you and your descendants, I will make a great nation. In other words... A, a populous people. A, a, a prominent populous people. The second part of it was, and I will give you this land as an eternal inheritance. The promised land. The land of Canaan, which we've been talking about throughout this entire series. The, the promised land, which would be a perpetual inheritance for God's chosen people. It would be their, their land. That's part two. Part three is, and through you, through you, I will bless the world. In other words, I am calling you, not specifically so that you alone will be my people and everybody else will be forgotten. No. I am calling you to be the conduit of my blessings for the whole world. Israel was called to be a blessing in the Old Testament. We as the church today are called to be a blessing to the world as part of the new covenant laid out and established in Christ in the New Testament. Be a blessing. Be a blessing. As we look at chapter 48, 49, we're going to read several different blessings that Jacob is going to speak. Some of them express a desire to invoke God's favor. Some of them, quite honestly, convey Jacob's disappointment and rebuke towards his sons and towards their posterity. But in all of the different blessings, we see prophetic implications for what will lie ahead in the generations to come. Yeah. First point this morning is called Jacob meets his grandsons. Jacob meets his grandsons. Starting in chapter 48, verse 1, it says, Now it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. And when it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel collected his strength and set up in his bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at loose in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said, Behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and I will make you a company of peoples, and I will give this land to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. Now to your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to Egypt, they are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. 
But your offspring that you have born after them shall be yours, and they shall be called by the names of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I came to pa came from Paden, Rachel died to my sorrow in the land of Canaan on the journey, while there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Last week in our sermon, we read that Jacob and his family left Canaan, and they moved to Egypt during the famine. If you remember part of that message last week, you can go back and look if you want to. Jacob met with and spoke to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh asked him how old he was. And Jacob said, I'm 130 years old. Well, at the end of chapter 49, which we're going to get to next week, but we're almost going to get there today, Jacob dies at the age of 147. So from 130 to 147 is 17 years. And the context of the blessings that we're going to read in chapter 48 and 49 lead me to believe at least that he spoke them right before he died, or at least in the days right before he died. So what does that tell us? That tells us that approximately 17 years have passed since the end of chapter 47 and the beginning of chapter 48. That's why it says, after these things. So the famine is over. Jacob and his family have been living now in Goshen for several years. And now, as we approach the end of Jacob's life, it says that he becomes sick. Deathly sick. He is going to die at the end of chapter 49. News comes to Joseph that his father Jacob, who is again now living in Egypt in Goshen, is very ill. And so Joseph takes his two sons with him, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they go to see Jacob. And it says that in, in verse 2, Israel collected his strength and set up in a bed. When, when he saw them arrive, when he heard that they were there, he, he set up and he, and he began to address them. <clears throat> In those verses we read, he did three things. First of all, he reminded Joseph of God's promise. It's a promise that we have read throughout this entire series. God first made the promise to Abraham. He repeated it to Abraham multiple times. He then repeated the promise to Isaac multiple times. He then repeated the promise to Jacob multiple times. And now Jacob is encouraging Joseph that God has promised him that he is a he is in the line of the Abrahamic covenant that he is chosen specifically he refers to the appearance of God at Luz which is Bethel the promise that God will bless his descendants, multiply them into a great nation, and give them the land of Canaan as an her eternal <coughs> possession. That's the first thing he did. He encouraged Joseph. Secondly, in verse 5, he adopted Joseph's sons. He adopted Ephraim and Manasseh as his own children. Now let's not just pass over that. Let's think about that for a minute. And interestingly enough, in my family, I have an example I can give you. I've mentioned this, shit, this man before. My cousin, Stephen, he's a year older than me. We grew up as best friends. We, we grew up more like brothers. But he's my cousin. Sort of. I say sort of. He was born to my mother's sister, my aunt. He was her firstborn child. She had him when she was relatively young. She had him when she was at a place in her life 
where her and the, and the guys she were living with were not uh, in the best place, and they felt like that they couldn't raise Stephen. They couldn't raise him. They couldn't have a baby. They, they didn't know what to do. Praise God. Praise God that they didn't abort the baby. That's another sermon altogether. They had Stephen. They gave him up for adoption. And guess who adopted him? My grandparents. Judy's parents adopted him. We see grandparents raising kids all the time these days for all sorts of reasons. But in this case, Stephen was adopted by his grandparents. And so he became his mother's brother legally. Biologically, he's her son. Legally, he's her brother. Legally, he's my uncle. Biologically, he's my cousin. Now, I use that as an example. That's what we see happen here. Ephraim and Manasseh were Joseph's sons. But we see Jacob, Joseph's father, their grandfather, adopt them as his own. And therefore, legally speaking, they now become Joseph, their father's brothers, from the standpoint of the inheritance. Jacob's inheritance will now be divided, Joseph's share will be divided among Ephraim and Manasseh. That's the second thing he did. And then the third thing he did was he explained why he buried Rachel in, uh, along the side of the road on the way to Bethlehem. We remember that story. Rachel died while giving childbirth to Benjamin, and they were on the road traveling when that happened, and Jacob buried her there on the road to Ephrath, on the road to Bethlehem. Why did he feel the need to explain it? Well, at the end of this conversation, he's going to ask Joseph to take care of his own burial. And so probably he was thinking about his own burial and the question he was going to ask forthcoming and it prompted him to explain why he had buried Joseph's mother, whom he was talking to, where he did. Before we move on to the second point, I would, I would just point out here that even though Jacob was deathly sick, even though Jacob was bedridden, he was delighted to see Joseph, and I would, I would submit to you, he was even more delighted to see his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Most grandparents have a special place in their heart <laughs> for their grandchildren. You see, we, we've all heard this before, but there's, there's some truth to it. Grandparents can do things with their grandchildren that they couldn't do for their kids. Grandparents can spoil their grandchildren rotten, right? And then they don't have to deal with the consequences. I know that whenever, even to this day, and they're, you know, 22, almost 16 later this month, even to this day, whenever we go to my mom's house or when we go to Janice's mom's house, one of the questions we always get before we come, what do the kids want to eat? What, what do they like? <laughs> we got to go to the store and fill up the refrigerator with all the stuff that they want. When they were little, they especially did. And we'll show up and they've got so much junk in the house, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's just bizarre old world. I mean, it's one of those situations where I look at Janice after three or four days and I think to myself, if we don't go home, their teeth are going to rot out and fall. We get, we get, we've got to get out of here. What do they want to eat? What fun things do they want to do? What, you know, what, what, what do the grandkids want? Special relationship between grandparents and grandchildren. You know, it's been said that genes skip a generation. Well, if that's the case, then grandparents and grandkids have more in common than grandparents to parent or parent to kid. In a lot of cases, you know, it's kind of like in the workplace. The parents, the middle management. 
They get it from both sides. You know, they, these two are the ones that are, are, are akin to each other more closely. Jacob was delighted to see Ephraim and Manasseh, and I think it speaks to the relationship, the undeniably unique and special bond between grandparents and grandchildren. Some of my greatest memories are at Grandma's house. Grandma's house. I love you, Mom and Dad, but I'm just speaking truth. Amen? Second point this morning is called Jacob blesses his grandsons. Let's pick it up where we left off in verse 8. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Now who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me. So he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were so dim from age he couldn't see. So Joseph brought them close to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your children as well. Then Joseph took them on his knees and bowed his face. Joseph took them from his knees and bowed with his face to the ground and put Ephraim on his uh, took Ephraim with his right hand and put him towards Israel's left and, and Manasseh with his left hand and put him towards Israel's right. And Israel stretched out his hands and laid his right hand on the hand of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, who was the older, crossing his hands, and he began to bless them. Uh, and, and I won't really that whole blessing to you, but, but he began to bless them. Verse 17, when Joseph saw that the father had that his father had laid the right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him, and he grasped his father's head and removed it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said, Not, not so, uh, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused and says, I know my son, and he will also be a people, and he will also be great. However, the younger brother shall be greater than he. And all his descendants shall become a multitude. And he, and he blessed them in verse 20, verse 21. And then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I give you one more portion than all of your brothers from the land which I took from the hand of Amorites with my sword and my bow. If you read through that, it becomes clear that Jacob's eyesight was bad. Perhaps due to his age, Perhaps in part due to his sickness. We don't know exactly what all the symptoms of his sickness were. But he was having a hard time seeing. Now he had heard that Jacob and his grandsons were there. He was delighted by it. He began to speak to them. But he, he could not see them well. Some, some commentators suggest that this is the first time he ever met them. So he didn't really know who they were. I, I find that hard to believe. If, if Jacob lived there for 17 years in Egypt, it seems to me that Joseph would have probably come sometime during that time and introduced his kids to him. The reason I don't think he recognizes them here is because he, he, he just can't see them because his eyesight is poor. Nevertheless, Jacob presents his sons to, or Joseph presents his sons to Jacob to bless them. And there's, a, there's an interesting uh, verse here that, that I'll point out to you just because I, I don't want us to read over it. In verse 12, it says, He took them from his knees, and he bowed with his face to the ground. Now, before we just skip over that verse, I want you to, to catch this. Joseph is the prince of Egypt. And yet, here in this place, on this day, Joseph bows down before his father. Joseph, though highly exalted, humbled himself and bowed down before his father in his sign of deference and respect to his father. I just point that out to you because I think it's important that we realize that respecting our authorities and our elders is something that's quickly dying in our culture today. The lack of respect we see demonstrated for police officers, for border patrol, for 
authorities in the workplace, employers, for families, within the family, for fathers, for mothers. It's, it's astounding. But it's not surprising because that's what Scripture predicts will happen in the last days. But I just want to point out because it, it's indicative of the kind of person that Joseph was. He bowed before his father. He presented his sons. Now notice he put Manasseh on Jacob's right hand side because Manasseh was the oldest. He put Ephraim on his father Jacob's left hand side because Ephraim was the youngest. He did that intentionally because traditionally the blessing of the right hand goes to the oldest son. It's a privileged status. Think about it. The right hand is a more honored place than the left hand. Jesus sits on the right. right hand of God the Father. The right hand is higher than the left hand. If you ever watch the Olympics, the gold medal stands in the middle. The silver medal is on the right, right hand. The right is higher than the left. Manasseh being the oldest son in Joseph's mind was entitled to the greater blessing, the right hand. But if you read this, you notice what happens is Jacob takes his right hand, I'm, I'm backwards from you guys, but he takes his right hand and instead of placing it on Manasseh, he reaches across and places it on Ephraim, the youngest son, and then he takes his left hand and he reaches across and lays it on Manasseh, Scripture says, thereby crossing his arms. And he begins to pronounce the blessing. Joseph sees what is happening and he intervenes because he thinks that his father is making a mistake. Perhaps he thinks his father can't see well. Maybe he, he thought that Ephraim was Manasseh and vice versa, and he just, he, he just made a mistake. Perhaps he doesn't really know which one's the older and the younger, and, and so he, he just got him backwards. Maybe it was just an honest mistake. So Joseph intervenes in verse 17. He sees that his father had put the right hand on Ephraim's head, and it displeased him. And he intervenes and says, no, 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 dad, 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 dad. dad. Yeah, you're supposed to put your right hand on Manasseh, he's older. And your left on Ephraim, he's younger. But notice what Jacob says. Jacob says, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. Verse 19, I know, my son, I know, I'm fully aware. But Manasseh will become a people, and he will also be great. But his younger brother, Ephraim, will be greater than him. And therefore, he gets the right hand blessing. Ephraim will be greater than Manasseh. Look at the end of verse 20. Thus he, that's Jacob, put Ephraim before Manasseh. He did it on purpose. Chose the younger son over the older. And then in the final verses there of the chapter, he assures Jacob that after his death, God would continue to be with him. And he prophesies that one day, Joseph would return to Canaan, the land of his ancestors. One day, Joseph would go back to the promised land. That prophecy had a dual fulfillment. First of all, it was fulfilled in the fact that if you read during the Exodus, which happened approximately 400 years after all of this, Moses and the children of Israel exhumed or dug up, depending on how it was buried, it was probably put in one of those Egyptian crypts. But they took Joseph's body out of it, and they carried it back to the Promised Land. That's one fulfillment. The other fulfillment is that Joseph's posterity through Ephraim and Manasseh moved back to the promised land. Nevertheless, Joseph 
and his descendants return to the promised land during the Exodus some 400 years after this prophecy was made. Before I leave this point, I'll just point out to you, there is a pattern in Scripture throughout uh, the stories of Genesis especially that is, that is apparent and repeated again and again and again and again. And that is God choosing the younger son or one of the younger sons instead of the older son. Abraham wasn't the youngest of his brothers, but God chose Abraham and called him to the land of Canaan and initiated the Abrahamic covenant with him. Abraham had multiple sons. His oldest was Ishmael. The younger was Isaac. God chose to continue the covenant through Isaac. When Isaac grew older, he had two sons, Esau and Jacob. God chose to continue the covenant through the younger son, Jacob. And now Jacob has grown older. He's had 12 sons. The oldest was Reuben. But God has chosen to continue the covenant through Joseph, through Judah. He has chosen the younger sons. I say continue the covenant. I shouldn't say that. God has chosen to elevate these two as the two most honored and greatest tribes among the covenant people at this point. Joseph was not a patriarch, but Joseph was among the 12 tribes through his sons Ephraim and Manasseh. Yeah. The patriarchs ended Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you see a repeated pattern of always choosing the younger son. And now, here we see not Manasseh being chosen, but Ephraim. And we learn throughout history that Ephraim does become a greater tribe than Manasseh. By the way, this pattern is not just limited to these stories that we read starting in the age of the patriarchs. We can go all the way back to the very beginning. Who, who were the sons of uh, um, Adam and Eve? Cain was the oldest, but God chose Abel. And then after Abel was slaughtered, he chose Seth. He didn't choose Cain. What, what is the deal with this repeated pattern? I can give you more examples. There's, there's Zerah and Perez. Zerah stuck his hand out first, showing his fir firstness. And remember the, uh, 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 what's the word? The nurse tied a, a ribbon around it, but then Perez shot out before him. Again, showing a, a preeminence. How about with the ladies? Jacob loved Leah. Uh, Re, uh, Leah was the oldest, but Jacob loved Rachel, Rachel the younger. Over and over and over again, it's driven home there. God is trying to show us something here. And I, I, I don't know that I understand all of it, but I will tell you this. It shows us clearly that God's ways are different than man's ways. Because man's ways, the tradition, the oldest has preeminence. But in God's ways, he's consistently not choosing the older. Perhaps it's an allusion to the fact that Israel came first, but Israel failed and God chose the church to do what Israel failed to do. Perhaps it's an allusion to just the New Testament teaching where Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, the first shall be last, but the last shall be first. Maybe there's a lesson here that if we want to be the greatest, if we want to be first place, if we want to have the rights and the privileges and the preeminence, then we need to humble ourselves and become servants and become the least of these. I don't know all the reasons why, but what I do see is a consistent pattern. God choosing the younger over the older. Well, I've got a whole chapter here in just a few minutes left. 
So let's look at chapter 49 quickly. The last point is called Genesis. I'm sorry, the last point is called Jacob blesses his sons. Jacob has blessed his grandsons. Now in chapter 49, he's going to bless his sons. And I'm just going to talk about it as I read it so we can move through it quickly. Jacob summoned his sons. Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together in here, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. And he begins to bless his sons. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have pre preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, you defiled it, you went up to my couch. He was the firstborn. He should have been the preeminent son, but he was rejected as the preeminent son, in part because he slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. You remember that earlier in the series? And therefore, Jacob rejected him, described him as uncontrolled as water, like raging water that's out of control. Mm -hmm. Reuben was a, 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 a impulsive, uh, he was, he was uh, undisciplined, and the people that, that derived from his, his posterity became known in the same way. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let, them, let my soul not enter their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly because in their anger they slew men and their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger for it is fierce and their wrath for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. If you remember, Simeon and Jacob were the two brothers who banded together when their sister Dinah was raped Remember that message earlier this, this, uh, this year? And they went into the city of Shechem, and rather than just uh, killing the person responsible, they killed the entire city of men. They killed all the animals. And as I recall, and I may be wrong, I think they even killed the women and children. They killed everybody. It was a wild, extreme overreaction. Granted, their sister had been raped, and there was justice to be done, but they, they went way too far. And they're rebuked here. And it says, you're going to be scattered. And that's exactly what happened. The tribe of Simeon received an inheritance within the inheritance of Judah, and they became scattered and assimilated to the point that they really kind of ceased to exist as a distinct tribe. The Levites were also scattered. They were chosen as the priestly line, therefore they did not receive an inheritance, and they were placed in cities that were scattered all over so that there would be Levites in every tribal lot. That prophecy became absolutely true. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's well. From the prima son you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, a reference to Christ. And to him shall be the obedience of all his people. He ties his foal to a vine, his funky's coal to the choicest vine. He washes his garments in wine, his robe in the blood of grapes, his eyes are adult from wine, his teeth are white from milk. He describes Judah as having leadership over the other tribes. That's exactly what happened. Judah got the largest allotment of land. Judah had uh, 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 dominance over the other, the other brothers and the other tribes. Judah is described as never uh, losing the scepter. King David came from the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. In fact, Jesus is called the Lion of Judah. And do you notice what they described him as? A lion. A lion. All of that came true. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore. He shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be towards Sidon. That's exactly true as well. The tribe of Zebulun was nestled uh, near the Mediterranean Sea in the northern parts towards Phoenicia, and uh, they were they were uh, ocean-faring people. They uh, uh, sold trades and wares on the seas, and, and this just describes exactly uh, what happened with them. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. 
When he saw a resting place was good, and the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulders to bear burdens, and became a slave of forced slavery. Again, the tribe of Issachar ended up becoming known for their blue-collar, laborious work. They became a tribe that became known for their, their fierce uh, uh, labor and for the, uh, for the work that they did. And so this is a fitting description. A strong donkey bearing burdens, carrying loads, doing the work. Dan shall be a judge for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the rider's heels so that his riders fall backwards. The tribe of Dan is compared to a serpent. When we think about a serpent, who do we think about? Satan. The tribe of Dan was the most evil of the twelve tribes. History will tell us that they chased after all sorts of idols. They, they committed all sorts of of wickedness and iniquity and sin. And as a result, the tribe of Dan became, um, um, well, just lost. Lost in their way. Lost in their uh, faith. They lost credibility. They lost status. And as a matter of fact, they even kind of lost their, their standing as one of the tribes. The tribe of Dan is the lost tribe of Israel that you read about. Fortunately, God restores them in the end because God's in the business of saving the lost. Verse 18, it says, For your salvation I wait, O Lord. Jacob, right here in the middle, falls to say a, a short prayer. And then he continues. As for Gad, raiders shall raid him, but he will raid at their heels. Uh, the tribe of Gad became known as a, 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 a tribe of warriors, raiders. As for Asher, his food shall be rich. He shall be he shall yield royal dainties. The tribe of Asher became known as having uh, the most luxuries because of the, the, the land that they inherited was exceedingly fruitful. They became the most, uh, I guess you would say, pampered. <laughs> Of the groups. Naphtali is a deer let loose. Who, he gives beautiful words. Naphtali uh, became perhaps the most independent minded, you would say. They lived uh, kind of north of, of the Sea of Galilee, the tribe that derived from Naphtali. They had a very independent streak about them. They lived, they pretty much. Uh, uh, stayed to themselves or lived quiet, peaceful, humble lives and, and didn't rely on uh, the, their brothers or the other tribes nearly as much. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. Its branches run over a wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot him and harassed him. His bow remained firm. His arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there, for there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. From the God of your father who helps you, the Almighty who blesses you with blessings uh, from above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath, blessings of the breast of the womb, blessings of your father have surpassed my blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills may they, they all be on the head of Joseph and the crown of his head, the one distinguished among his brothers. I don't have time to go through all that, but let me just tell you, he got the best blessing. Joseph was the favorite son. He got the greatest blessing. All of those are good things. May God bless you bountifully, even more than my own ancestors. And then lastly, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours his prey. In the evening he divides the spoils. Benjamin is compared to a wolf. The tribe of Benjamin, though it was small, they had a chip on their shoulder. You ever seen a little dog that thinks it's the biggest dog in the world? I've got one in my house. That's the tribe of Benjamin. They were little bitty, but I tell you what, that one thing would set them off. They thought they were the baddest tribe of all of them. As a matter of fact, the tribe of Benjamin at one point went to war with all of the other tribes. Because they got bit sideways about something. 
Again, a very fitting description for the tribe of Benjamin. Jacob blessed his grandsons in chapter 48. Then Jacob blessed his sons in chapter 49. And as I wrap up, and the generations that come after this series and this, this uh, uh, book of Genesis... If we read the rest of Jewish history, which if you stay here at Calvary, we'll, we'll learn about it in the years as we go through it. Amen. What you're going to discover is that Jacob's sons would father tribes that would develop into the 12 tribes of Israel. And these tribes would become characterized by the blessings of and the descriptions that Jacob spoke over them here in chapter 49 at the end of his life. Yes, the tribes were distinct from one another, but as kinsmen, collectively, they formed the nation of Israel. And following the conquest of Canaan, which was still almost 400 years after this, during the days of Moses and Joshua, each of these tribes that derived from these sons would receive a portion of the promised land in keeping with God's covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which we've been reading about throughout this series. The twelve tribes of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Ephraim and Manasseh actually represent Joseph who received a double portion because he got two inheritances through his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who Jacob adopted. We read about it today. That's why Jacob's name isn't in the list of the tribes. He is represented by Ephraim and Manasseh. Levi is not listed in the tribes because he was designated, his line was designated as the priestly tribe, and therefore they did not receive an inheritance either. Instead, they were purposely scattered amongst the other 12 tribes so that all 12 tribes would have priests to perpetuate their Jewish faith. So it's good to know. This is where the 12 tribes came from. That's why Ephraim and Manasseh are there. That's why Levi is not there. Of course, Levi was still a unique tribe, but they weren't together collectively. They were spread out. And so they're not listed as one of the 12 tribes of Israel who received land. Now, all of that is just information. And you think about that and you think, well, mm, okay. But if you understand that, then it makes understanding the rest of the Old Testament so much more easy. Because the rest of the Old Testament is going to talk about things from the standpoint of the tribes. That's why we need to learn these details. But let me close with the spiritual application. Very, very simple. I'm going to take us right back to where we started and we're done. Jacob blessed his sons. And in the same way, beloved, we are called to bless others. We are called to be a blessing to the world around us. And let's bring it right down to home. We here in this room today, we watching on Facebook, we as the people of Calvary Baptist Church, along with our brother and sister Christians at First Baptist and, and Harvest and other places, we are called to be a blessing to the lost people in Seymour and Baylor County, and there's lots of them. And so may we get busy doing what God has called us to do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this word. Lord, I know that there was a lot of just information today, but I think the overarching point, at least that you've driven home to me this week, is that 
we are called to not only be a blessing, but to also speak and pray for blessings for the lost people and for the other people here in our community. And so I close today with just a brief petition. God, I pray, Lord, that you would show your love and your favor. Lord, that you would give your protection and your provision. Lord, to the lost people here in Seymour in this area. God, pour it out on us as well, but I pray also for the lost. And I pray the hearts would be turned to you. Lord, that people would be saved. Lord, that your people might grow here in this area because of the bountiful outpouring of your Spirit in Seymour and Baylor County. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.